Uh, most typical efficient LANs are about 30 microseconds. So that's, uh, um, that's the sort of latency I get at home uh, on my uh, 25 pound network card, uh, network adapter. But um, whereas a lot of data grids are actually much higher than this, a lot of distributed data systems, they, they look to be sub millisecond. That's usually a nice round number. And to some degree, being sub millisecond is really what it's about because they sort of think, well, if they're sub millisecond, they won't d spend the engineering effort to make it any faster than that because it, that sounds pretty fast. But in reality, uh, it's actually an enormous amount of time and we're actually talking about light travel at 160 kilometers in that time. Um, and you can actually get much closer, instead of 800, you can get much closer to 30, uh, if you try hard enough. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, lights, um, I'm pretty sure it's 60 hertz in Europe, so as it is in the UK, and uh, with 60 hertz, it actually, the lights turn off um, 120 times a second, so twice in each cycle. So the lights are turning off um, every eight milliseconds, but you can't see it because that's just too fast. Uh, in fact, in a cinema, it, the, uh, the frame changes from one frame to the next every uh, 45th of a second, which is around 20, a uh, little over 20, millisec yeah, 20 milliseconds, and you can't see that. So at about 20 milliseconds, um, is a sort of a threshold that if it's below that, you probably can't see it, and therefore you're definitely in the low latency space. Uh, above that, it's sort of a bit more questionable. Interestingly enough, there are people who can see um, uh, very low, uh, uh, that, that kind of latency. Um, and they mentioned, one lady's mentioned in the Guinness Book of Records, she can see uh, flickering at a very high rate and she can't go to see movies because they just annoy her the whole time because she can see each frame actually changing. Um, uh, 4G in the UK has got a latency of about 55 milliseconds. So that's considered uh, reasonable, but it's way above the, uh, the microsecond range. Why consistency matters? The reason we focus on consistency is because the a customer tends to remember the worst performance they ever got, not necessarily the best. And in particular, when it comes to failures in your system, it'll be because there were the worst delays you ever had, not your average delays. So if you really focus on bringing down your worst uh, performance, your worst impacts, your worst one in 100, worst one in 1,000, you can really help improve the consistency and stability of your system. So performance actually has an impact on stability as well. Um, another reason for mo focusing on these higher numbers, uh, higher percentiles, is that sometimes this can help you get approval for improving performance. So often you might say, well, I'm not happy with the performance of the system, or it would be really interesting to solve some of these performance problems, but I can't get approval for it. And that's because maybe you're reporting average latencies. Average latencies can look very good. They can be under the 20 millisecond range, and therefore they'll say, well, that's something I can't even see. Um, why would we make it any faster? But then you start to look at the percentiles. You start looking at the 99th percentile, your three nines as well, because they're the ones that will help hurt your um, stability. And then they will be th much higher. So typically, even in a well-tuned system, I would say that the two nines is about four times your typical and your three nines will be 10 times your typical. And that's if you're well tuned. So they can be 100 times. And if you start to report those numbers, they start, they're obviously much bigger, and they go, whoa, one in a thousand is this, you know? It's a couple of seconds. Oh, that sounds terrible. Uh, how about we spend some time improving performance? And yet, it's the same system. So how you report these numbers can actually help you get approval to spend more time trying to fix them and the upshot of that is that you will have a much more stable system. So what is ultra low GC? So this is one approach for dealing with the pause of GC. Uh, another approach is what, for example, Azul use, where they have a concurrent collector, which is c continuously cleaning up the garbage as you go along. Um, however, there's another approach that we take, and this is 
more uh, suitable when you have objects with very simple life cycles. When you have objects with simple life cycles, you can handle that yourself by reusing them, making them mutable, and so on. As the life cycle for the objects get more complex, the work in managing it yourself just goes up exponentially. So it's not even linear. As, as it gets more complex, more complex data structures, it just becomes a nightmare very quickly. So if you've got objects with simple life cycles, managing themselves is, is probably a good idea. But if you don't, then uh, a more general solution like Azul is actually a better option. Um, so, so what we do is actually reduce the... We, in trading systems, we generally deal with objects with very simple life cycles, very simple data structures. And um, so what we do is we make the Eden size really big. So we make the garbage rate really low, the, the Eden size really big, and so we get very few GCs. And in fact, the aim for a lot of trading systems is to GC less than once a day and treat it as an overnight maintenance task. So why, why is this important? Well, this is um, for a generational um, uh, layout. Uh, it doesn't, G1 doesn't work this way, but Parallel and CMS do. Uh, you have objects get created in the Eden space, which is continuous. Uh, then the, they get copied to the to and from survivor spaces, backwards and forwards, and eventually end up in the tenured space. Large objects go straight into tenured space. Java 8 is very similar. The main difference is that PermGen went away, but Metaspace basically replaced it. I think the reason why they didn't call it PermGen 2.0 is because they wanted to tune everything differently, they used different arguments, and just to avoid confusion, they just gave it a completely different name. Another thing that's important is in, uh, in JVMs, uh, Hotspot in particular, is the use of compressed uh, OOPs. Now what compressed OOPs means is that you will use four bytes of, uh, in your address space rather than eight. Uh, and it can do this for up to 32 gigabytes of memory. Now, if you're used to like C, C program or C++ program, 32-bit applications can only access four gigabytes. But the reality is that um, objects in Java are always aligned. They're always on a multiple of eight-byte boundaries, which means that in reality, um, the address of every object, the lower three bits, is always zero. So you don't need to store it. So what compressed oops does is that if you've got less than four gigabytes or well under with a little bit of margin, it just stores it untranslated. But if it's a bit bigger, it's between four and about 28, it can just multiply the address by eight, which means you don't have to store the lower three bits. And you can access now a much wider range of memory with just a 32-bit reference. And finally, with a bit of offset, you can uh, get all the way up to about 32 gigabytes. And if you've got a very large memory on your machine, like 128 gigs or more, by default, your heap maximum heap size will be 32 gigabytes, and it fits within this compressed OOPS size. Um, the reason this is important in Java, in particular compared to other languages, is that Java has a lot of references to things. In something like C++, you can have a data structure inside another data structure, inside another data structure. And they're literally inside. You don't need a reference from one to the next. You don't have as many references. But in Java, you have a lot more references. And so the size of each reference really matters. And you can save a lot of memory by using 32-bit references rather than 64. Uh, Java 8 added an option to allow you to increase the byte alignment. Uh, which means that you're adding more padding for each object, but it allows you to go up to uh, 128 gigabytes of heap uh, without and still use 32-bit references. Um, by the way, this is a feature that's on by default. So it's not necessarily something you need to worry about, but it's good to know you don't need to worry about it. You look concerned. Um, yes, but you, it uses a preferred 
It uses an offset if it's between 28 and 30. Yeah, so 28 is a magic number, you're right. Um, the, other, the other thing is that between 28 and 32, you do get a performance hit. It has to do more work on every memory operation. So keeping it under 28 is a good idea. The reason this is relatively cheap is shifting by three is something that Intel has built in support for. The reason it has this is because it accesses doubles and longs using it. So, uh, so again, if you use 16-bit uh, align uh, byte alignment, that's more expensive because there's no intrinsic function that does this. It actually has to shift it. Or it has to use more operations to uh, achieve the same thing. So, uh, so how can you... Um, so this is a more extreme example where you're using 16 uh, byte alignment. Say you've got an Eden space of 48 gigabytes. Mm -hmm. The reason I picked that is just to get nice round numbers. That means that if you cr have a budget of, say, 2 gigabytes an hour of garbage, you can run now for 24 hours before the Eden even fills up. The reality is we tend to use off-heap um, data structures and we don't need to make the Eden anywhere near that big. But um, say, say you, you have um, uh, this size, then you can create two, you have a budget of two gigabytes an hour, which is, translates to about half a megabyte a second. So you can create half a megabyte a second and ha still have a system that takes an entire day just even have a minor collection. So it doesn't mean that you can't use any libraries that weren't designed to be ultra low GC. You just can't use them a lot, right? So you can use them in a lot of important places, just not on your critical path. Uh, another thing that's important, we find that in low latency systems, is the time it takes to warm up your code to respond to an event. And um, this is where keeping your caches hot and only having useful data in them is important. If you're creating a lot of garbage, then what can happen is that you're literally just filling your caches with garbage, objects you will never use again, and it causes the data that you actually will need and reuse to scroll out. And this can be at a, a very high rate. So say, for example, you're producing 300 megabytes a second. 300 megabytes a second is a very moderate rate for a web server. But in reality, if that's on one, thr on one core, you're actually filling the L2 cache with garbage every um, millisecond. Right? So you, anything you accessed a millisecond ago will probably have been pushed out by the, all the garbage you're creating. So if you don't have any GC pauses, all your problems are solved. Well, no, that's not really the case, is that even in, um, even in regular applications, your biggest pauses won't necessarily be GC. There's waiting for uh, networks, waiting for database, disks, reads, and writes can take a very long time um, based on a sequence of events. Um, OS interrupts, uh, some you can turn off, some you cannot. And so you will get, an, by number, most of the interrupts will actually be from the OS. They're usually very short, um, so you may not care about them, but certainly by number, the most interrupts are by the OS, and they don't show up in the JVM. There's no monitoring in the JVM which will tell you how often a thread was interrupted by the OS. So, um, but it, they're usually at such a low level that that doesn't cause a problem. However, um, they can do, uh, and you can get uh, occasional delays that are well into the milliseconds due to OS interrupts. Um, on virtualized systems, you can see delays of 50 milliseconds, which are not caused by the GC. They don't appear in the like, application stop time because it's actually not the application driving the delay in, in the first place. It's not aware of it. So how does Java 8 help? Um, Java 8, 8 helps in a couple of ways is that it has a thing called capturing lambdas. And what capturing lambdas do is that they uh, are, sorry, non-capturing lambdas. Non-capturing lambdas are ones that are automatically uh, turned into static fields. And so they don't, um, uh, every time you create, use them, it doesn't create any more garbage. And another area is uh, escape analysis, which, uh, depending on your use case, can help a lot or not at all. 
So it's a bit, uh, unfortunately, escape analysis, while very cool, is, um, is a bit hit and miss, but it is worth knowing that it's there. Um, so let's have a look at some examples of code. We have uh, three lambdas here. Now what's interesting about these lambdas is that uh, the first example and the last example are non-capturing. And because they're non-capturing, they don't create a new object each time. They don't create any garbage. They are created once on when they're first used, and then from then on it just keeps reusing the same object. Now the middle example, which actually does the same thing as the last example, or effectively the same thing, um, is capturing. It actually captures system.out. And this has a number of consequences. Uh, one of them is that because in the first example it always returns the same object, they're actually equal. But in the second example it creates a new object each time, they're not equal. And even dot equals says they're not equal. Um, for lambdas, the dot equals and the equal 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 is the same. There's no, no special comparison it does to say these two lambdas are equivalent in any way. And finally, because these two return the same object, um, this is equal. One of the upshots of this is that if you put lambdas in a set, you can get surprising behavior. So if I put the first two into a set, I'll have a set of one. If I put the second two in a set, I'll have a set of two. And if I put the last two in a set, I have a set of one. The reason this is interesting is that IntelliJ will suggest you refactor this into this. But you can have the side effect that if that's put into a set, it will change its behavior. Uh, another upshot is that if you put these into a set, um, the middle one you can will be very hard to remove from the set. So because if you create a new one, it says they're not equal, and you can never remove it. Whereas in the first example, it's easier to obtain the same object, and so that when you remove it from a set, you can actually do it. Of course, the problem is that most people don't check that remove fails. So you can call remove, all the code works, but it's not actually removing it, and you've got perhaps a, a resource leak. Serialization. So one of the things we do with lambdas is we serialize them. And this can have some interesting consequences. Uh, one, one of them is that lambdas capture less scope than anonymous inner classes do. An anonymous inner class will tend to capture this, whether it's used or not. Uh, whereas a uh, non-capturing lambda doesn't um, include this unless you've actually explicitly call used it in the code. And this makes it um, easier to serialize because one of the, the problems with having an um, anonymous inner class is it's very hard to set them up so that they can be serialized. So here's an example. Um, this one is a capturing um, object, so it cannot be serialized. Sorry, this is a capturing lambda. So it cannot be serialized because system.out is not serializable. However, this is non-capturing. It gets system.out by running code, not by capturing it and then storing it as a field. So we, in fact, this it will actually serialize. And then the last example, this is like the previous one, except that this will implicitly capture the outer object, even though it's not used. And because the outer object in this case is not serializable, the whole thing blows up. The worst case is the outer object is actually serializable, in which case you're passing an object across the wire or to disk or saving it, which you never intended to save. Um, so by the way, uh, there's a couple of different ways of making lambdas serializable. And we believe that the simplest way for a user of an API is to actually have interfaces that um, extend serializable. Um, you can actually do it um, without this, but uh, you end up writing quite a lot of boilerplate code that in reality, I think, makes it um, harder to read than not using a lambda at all. Uh, so it's quite horrible. So why would you serialize a lambda? Well, we, we use this internally in our stuff because um, what we want to do is we want to be able to give the client to be able to say what it wants to run on a server. So in this example, we have a map which is visible on a client, 
client uh, but is actually sitting on a server and we want to apply an action atomically to the value of a key that's on the server. If you try and do that from the client, you would have to use some sort of distributed lock. Whereas if you have a Lambda that you serialize, you send to the server, it's run on the server atomically, and then the result is sent back, any result that you want to collect, um, then you actually save a lot of overhead. So serializing Lambdas is actually very cool. Um, one of the downsides is that uh, the code on the server has to match the code on the client. So this is one of the caveats of doing that because this doesn't actually pass this code to the server. So it's got pluses and minuses. Um, the downside is that you can get breaks between the client and server, but it also means that th the client can't, someone using the client can't add code that was never deployed to the server and you never wanted on the server. Can't um, easily add code that wasn't there or was never intended to be on the server in the first place. But this is uh, one way of elegantly describing uh, both what I expect to have run on the client and what I expect to have run on server. So a more complicated example is where I've got a map and I want to get back all of the keys that match some regular expression. Now I could suck down all of the keys to the client, run, uh, run the pattern matching, but the, the reality is that I might only want a fraction of all the keys possible for that map. Whereas uh, what this can do is pass the pattern to the server, pass this lambda to the server, it compiles the pattern, goes through all the keys locally, and then only returns the resultant set. It's a very um, elegant way of passing work and describing it all in one place as to what I want to do on the client and what I want to do on the server. Uh, last but not least, um, we also use this for um, live queries where we set up some filters and transformations on the client, but these are sent to the server and then um, executed on the server. Um, uh, at least one other data provider does this. Um, Hazelcast do this, for example. They have support for serializing lambdas. So I think it is a very useful concept. And in particular, lambdas make this easier than anonymous into classes, partly because of less boilerplate, but partly because it doesn't have that tendency to capture things it doesn't need. So, escape analysis. Escape analysis is, um, is an optimization where what it does is it looks to see whether an object escapes a method. So if it doesn't escape a method, it's not, not passed off to another method, it can optimize it in ways that it cannot safely do if uh, this is not the case. And um, in particular, two things it can do is it can take an object and put it on the stack instead of actually creating it on the heap. And that's of particular interest to us because it means we reduce the amount of garbage we produce. It also means that we can um, uh, not have to optimize uh, objects which it's going to optimize for us. So it would be a premature optimization for us to use our techniques where we reduce the amount of garbage if the, the JIT is going to do it for us anyway. Uh, another optimization which is useful, although we tend to avoid getting into this situation in the first place, is that you can have objects which are synchronized, but if it works out that this is never used in another method, therefore never used in another thread, it doesn't have to put do any locking for it. Uh, now, an important optimization that's required for escape analysis to work is inlining. So I said that um, it detects whether an object escapes a method, but the very, very likely that you will ca make calls on either that object or pass it to other methods. Does that mean it won't work? Well, what will happen though is that it can inline those methods. And if it inlines those methods, then you get a sort of uber method of code which has got all the inlined uh, methods, and now it does the, the check to say, after I've inlined everything, does it escape? And it's only then does it say, well, um, that, there, that it uh, can decide if it's going to um, be go outside that you know, effective method. Now, um, something to note is that um, as of at least update 60, there's plenty of examples where it, when it works, 
it's still not quite as efficient as handcrafting the code, but you get pretty close for very little effort. So um, it's uh, worth letting it do its job before deciding what you want to optimize. Um, another thing which, uh, I don't know whether these defaults have changed, but at the time I wrote this, one of the uh, gotchas of this was that there's a limit on when it will do an escape analysis. It looks at the number of bytecode of the effective method that's been after inlining, and if it's greater than, at the, at the moment, 150 bytes, it, it doesn't even try to do escape analysis. The reason that's, I, I think, a bit odd is because um, it requires inlining to do its job to for, for the escape analysis to run. And the limit at which it will tend to inline frequently uh, access methods is much higher. It's 325 bytes. So I've seen examples where, to start with, you've got some sequence of code and it's creating garbage. And then after a bit of inlining, it's worked out that, hey, uh, I don't need to uh, create this object. I can put it on the stack. The garbage goes away. And then suddenly it says, well, actually, I could inline more stuff. And the method gets bigger. Now it goes over the threshold and it starts creating garbage again because it's now got a method that's too big for escape analysis to run. So that's quite odd behavior. So what I suggest you do is you always make the um, limit for escape analysis higher than what your frequent inline size. And for some of the tests I've run, these are sort of numbers that I tend to use with a slightly higher uh, inline size and an even greater um, uh, bytecode estimate size. Okay, uh, so um, as I mentioned earlier, you really want to focus on latency rather than throughput. Uh, you've got some advantages in that it, if you do look at your latency distribution, you can see some of your worst latencies and um, they can help you either motivate you to fix them, it'll show you the problems you have in your system, but can also um, help get uh, support from your management that these are problems that need to be fixed. Whereas if you do the throughput, often the throughput is more than enough, and so uh, they'll say, well, why do you want to optimize it any further? Um, so it's worth mentioning Little's law, and in particular, um, why um, average latency is not a great measure, because average latency is a proxy for throughput. Um, concurrency is also a factor, but your average latency and your throughput uh, are quite often related to each other. Now, um, one of the things I find interesting is to calculate what is the effective concurrency of a system. So I take what is their average latency and you multiply it by the uh, throughput that they get and that gives you your average concurrency of your machine. And uh, I've worked in a couple of sites where they had uh, like this distributed microservices architecture uh, with lots of threads, lots of processes, lots of boxes. And yet when I multiplied the uh, average latency by the throughput, the concurrency was actually about 1.1. So in reality, they could have done pretty much the same job with one thread with a lot less effort and complexity because in reality, only on average 1.1 messages were being processed at any one time. Now, the problem with throughput is it's great for hiding uh, very bad latencies. And so if you want to hide bad latencies, uh, measure your throughput or average latency. But uh, if you want to solve interesting problems, then I suggest you focus on the latency. Uh, so I won't go through this example because I think we're, uh, I think I'm running out of time. Um, uh, so, flow control, no. Okay, so we're going back into lambdas again. So, um, so here's some uh, benchmarks we did um, comparing uh, an API that uses lambdas against Jackson, doing very much the same thing, uh, encoding a JSON message. And um, so what we found, uh, we've sim since optimized this a bit, but what we found was that um, you can get um, an API with a very flat profile even though we're using lambdas in their implementation. And in particular, it's these high percentiles and worst latencies uh, 
The difference between here and here is largely around that Jackson produces a little bit of garbage. Um, not a lot, but enough that you get occasional GCs, and these occasional GCs are showing up. Now, the one that had my head s scratched was uh, Beeson. I'm not sure why it's less efficient than JSON, uh, given that it's a binary format or that's equivalent to it. So uh, on the basis of this, I wouldn't use Beeson, simply because it's harder to read and it's slower. So the only reason to use a binary format, in my opinion, is for speed. And if it's not faster, I wouldn't bother. You may as well use uh, JSON. Um, uh, there was another binary one here as well, which was also Boon is a binary form of JSON as well. And it wasn't any faster. It was slower. Uh, so going into the APIs, uh, what we did here was we wanted to have um, to be able to put rich descriptions of our keys. So we have a number of fields, in this case four fields and four values. And then we want to read back these values and be able to uh, provide setters for them. Now by arranging um, this, by splitting the API, we could have just put this dot message is set, but then it would have become capturing. But by passing it in as an argument, an additional argument, all of these lambdas are non-capturing. So we, we had to change the API slightly to make it non-capturing by, by restructuring all the things you would otherwise have to have passed in to the lambda, but passing it in as an argument rather than just getting it from the current scope, then that way we can have non-capturing lambdas. So even though there's lots of lambdas being used here, um, these are actually all non-capturing and um, they don't create any GC. Now the interesting thing for me was that this um, originally was written using capturing lambdas and because of escape analysis, it would um, not create any garbage either. But the problem with escape analysis is that as the methods get more complicated, um, that it tends to just break uh, in ways that you can't always predict, or at least I can't always predict. And uh, so it was, it, I found it was dangerous. So if you did it for four fields with capturing lambdas, escape analysis is all great, didn't create any garbage. But if you went to about eight fields, then it just, uh, just very difficult to get it to w kick in, no matter how you tuned it. So uh, it works for simple code and simple examples, but as the examples get more complicated, for whatever reason, Escape analysis doesn't seem to work. Yeah. Ah, so, all right. So the question was, why are the uh, arguments for read and write lambdas? And um, there's a reason for that, which is that um, these are not um, just strings. They're a bit more than strings because we want to support things like field numbers. We want to support default values for fields. So uh, in this example, um, we want to have a data structure we can pass which specifies that the default value for this number is, say, zero. And um, if it's zero, we don't have to send it. So it can, you can, uh, as an option in YSA, I don't want to send uh, values that are actually the default. I just want to drop them. Uh, it's particularly useful when you have big data structures with lots of fields that are actually just default values. Um, and so the way we do that is that this is a lambda, or actually it's an interface with a lot of methods. So for example, the default implementation, the default value is null. The default implementation for the field number is the hash code of the string. But you want to, the ability to override those. And you can do that without changing the API. But the only abstract method is a method called name, which returns a string. So you can use it in a very simple form like this but you can add options, extra methods, that describe things like uh, um, other, other meta information, which allow you, which you may or not actually need, uh, depending on which Y you're using. Um, I'll come back to this, because there's actually an alternative to lambdas, which will achieve the same result. Um, so this looks like, uh, with a couple of different Ys, there's a binary form, a text form. Um, now, one of the interesting side effects is you can use lambdas with APIs that were never designed for lambdas. So this is a common pattern we actually use, is that in this example, we're looking to set a field called message with the message value. But for our testing purposes, 
Um, we don't really necessarily need to set it into a, a field of an object just so that we can check its value. Instead of passing this, we can pass the value we want it to be, and then we can call assert equals. Because what we'll do is it will take this value on the left and compare it and pass as the second argument the value we just read. And this allows us to um, simplify our testing code to make sure that all the values are actually what we think they should be. So this is the, um, uh, one of the points I was making about earlier, is that the type that we use for those lambdas is what we call wire key. And as I mentioned, there's a one field called name that returns a string. The interesting side effect of using that is that enums define for you a field, a method called name that returns a string, which is in fact the name of the enum. So now we can use enums in replace of lambdas into the same API and without actually having to override a, a name method because it, enums will do this for you. Now, uh, what we could do is add another method here that says um, code, which is our, uh, used for um, serializing field numbers instead of field names. That code could be ordinal in this case, or a safer option is to actually specify all the numbers. Um, and we can do that by extending this enum field. But we've actually used an enum interchangeably with a lambda, um, which is perhaps a surprising result. Uh, I'm not sure how many people use uh, interfaces on uh, enums, but we use that quite a lot. Uh, when to use lambdas, uh, when to use enums. So enums um, are much easier to debug than lambdas. So it's good to have an API that can support both because then you can use the one that makes more sense to, for your purposes. Uh, so you have an enum that implements the same interface that the lambda requires. So then you can, the reason why it's easier to debug is that when you see an enum in your debugger, it has the name of the enum. You can quite clearly say, this is what it is. Whereas if you see a, a generated lambda, you see almost nothing. If it's capturing, you'll see it's captured values. But if it's non-capturing, you see not even that. Um, it has a number, but unlike anonymous inner classes, which are numbered within a class, the numbers for lambdas are global. So from the start of the JVM. So from one run to the next, the same lambda could have a different number. So it's not very, it's difficult to debug lambdas. Um, also, as we mentioned earlier, you want to be able to, it's useful to be able to serialize lambdas, but it's not very cheap. Uh, it's quite a bit, it's quite expensive to serialize a lambda, whereas serializing an enum is trivial because all you need is the type and the, which enum you're talking about. Um, and also enums are easier to manage if you're responsible for the server because on the server you can define a whole series of enums which are all of the functions that you want to be able to support and then they can call that. But there was no requirement to change the API as such. You just specified in advance, these are the enums we support, these are the operations you can do. And um, if you have a look in this class for these two classes, we have some examples of that. When to use lambdas? Well, the lambdas are much simpler to write as just little snippets of code. Um, they have much better support for generics because enums are statically typed. They're not based on how they're used. And um, lambdas can capture, whereas enums cannot. Uh, so where can you try this out? Uh, as mentioned, these are links to a couple of different libraries that use quite a lot of these lambdas. And finally, do we have any questions? I think we have not very much time. Well, we have time for some questions if you want. So. Any questions? I see some quizzical faces. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You can ask me questions after the talk. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you.